Uh, hello and good evening. Uh, I guess good afternoon, good morning, and uh, to everyone joining from the United States. Um, Ohio gozaimasu to our attendees from Japan. And my name is, is Paul Pass, and I'm the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth. Welcome to our program on Japanese pop culture's response to COVID 19 in partnership with Japan Society and additional promotional support from the Japan America Society of Oregon. This event is also part of the Japanese government's Walk in U.S. Talk on Japan program. We're excited to share that almost 250 people have registered from around the globe, including from 12 countries and 22 states within the, within the U.S. I would also like to express our solidarity with the people of Japan, who recently marked 10 years since the Great East Japan earthquake, and although a lot of progress has been made since 2011, there's still much work to do to ensure a prosperous future in Tohoku. We also wish everyone safety and health during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected almost everyone on the planet in some way. Before we begin, I want to go over some suggestions to maximize your experience. Please note that your cameras and microphones are off. And if there are any technical issues, such as you are unable to hear the presenter, then please use the chat function. If you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. This webinar will be recorded and we plan to upload to YouTube soon on the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth channel. Now I would like to welcome Kazuo Kato, who is Senior Director for Global Partnerships and Initiatives at Japan Society. Kazuo san, please feel free to begin. Thank you so much, Paul, for this opportunity for Japan Society New York to partner with you once again and to update our audience on our recent activities. After being closed for a year, Japan Society just reopened our building to the public on March 11th in commemoration of the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and to present our spring gallery exhibition, When Practice Becomes Form, Carpentry Tools from Japan. For those in and also outside of New York, we'll continue to offer robust programs um, online, spanning arts and culture, business and policy, and language classes. And here are some upcoming highlights. On March 23rd, we'll be launching our 333 Contemporary Series, which is designed to engage young patrons with deep affinity for Japanese culture. Our inaugural event will center on the history of Japanese hip hop and how the music industry is preparing it for the global stage. To kickstart our sports theme program in lead up to the Tokyo Olympics, we're hosting a talk on April 7th to discuss the life and legacy of Rusty Kanokogi, known as the mother of women's judo, who played a key role in getting women's judo ratified as an official Olympic sport in 1992. Both of these programs are free with registration, so we hope some of our audience will consider attending. Please visit japansociety.org for more information. Thank you, Paul. Just, uh, there we go, there we go, great. Okay, so uh, I apologize. Thank you again, Kazuya san We are grateful that Japan Society thought of us in Dallas-Fort Worth for this unique opportunity, the program tonight, uh, to work with the Japanese government and highlight important issues facing both Japan and the US. Now I would like to introduce our moderator, Bill Tsutsui. We know him well in the Dallas area from his time at Southern Methodist University. He is currently the Edwin O. Reischauer Distinguished Professor of Japanese Studies at Harvard University. He is also a Godzilla expert, as you can see from, uh, you'll see uh, something in his background, uh, and he's the author of Godzilla On My Mind. Bill, please feel free to begin. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be moderating this discussion today for the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth and Japan Society, two organizations very near and dear to my heart and to share this virtual stage with three extremely knowledgeable and engaging panelists who will bring us some unique and I suspect surprising and provocative insights on Japanese popular culture during the ongoing pandemic. Now I know that no one tuned in to listen to me today, so I'm gonna get right into it and introduce our panelists who will each share about five minutes or so of their particular perspectives on COVID media and culture in Japan. 
We'll then have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so, uh, which I expect to be wide ranging and eye opening before taking some questions from the audience. So let me encourage you all through the event to please use the Zoom Q&A function to pose your questions to the group. We'll try and get through, through as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the program tonight. Speaking first today will be Aki Nakanishi, the Arlene Schnitzer Curator of Culture, Art and Education at the Portland Japanese Garden in Oregon. Aki is an expert in cultural di diplomacy having spent a decade as a cultural affairs specialist at the United States Embassy in Tokyo, where he oversaw a wide spectrum of cultural, creative, and educational activities designed to enhance mutual understanding between the United States and Japan. He has also worked at major media organizations in Japan, in the museum world, and as an independent art director, and has led a nonprofit organization for regional revitalization, leadership development, and youth empowerment across rural Japan. Second to speak will be Seo Nakajima, professor of sociology and Asian studies at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies at Waseda University in Tokyo. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Tokyo, a doctorate from UC Berkeley, and taught at the University of Hawaii before joining Waseda. His research focus is on the creative industries of Asia, and he has published widely on cinema and society in China and media and globalization in Japan. Professor Nakajima is starting on a fascinating new project on the next generation automobile industry in Japan, including its integration with media and the creative industries. Last but hardly least will be Roland Kelts, a writer, journalist, public intellectual and teacher who I suspect is familiar to many in the audience today for his influential book, Japan America, How Japanese Pop Culture Has Invaded the US, and for his insightful writings on Japan, Japanese pop culture, and global media in venues like the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, and the New York Times. He's a columnist for the Japan Times and has taught or held fellowships at the University of Tokyo, New York University, Columbia, Harvard, and Waseda. He is also a contributing editor for Monkey, New Writing from Japan, an exciting new literary magazine. Welcome to these great panelists. And Aki, please take us away. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Professor Tutsui, uh, for that invigorating introduction. That was really, really, um, oh my God, literally was invigorating. Thank you so much. It got me really excited. But first off, I want to thank you and the organizers, of course, for inviting me to the panel. I'm just so honored to be a part of this program along with such distinguished participants, including your very self, your very self, uh, Professor Tutsui. Well, today, I don't want to bore anyone in the audience with my history class, actually, but I thought it would be interesting to go back in time in order to kind of put the current affairs in a broad perspective. As a cultural diplomacy expert myself, I'd like to highlight the interconnectedness of different cultures by looking at the popular themes like ukiyo-e and Nihonten, that's Japanese gardens, and how reciprocity is actually a critical essence of um, cultural evolution. I guess that's even more relevant in today's, um, how can I say, technologically, culturally, and economically interconnected world. <clears throat> so with that, I'm just gonna start um, sharing my screen. And also with that, I'm gonna go right back in time about 400 years or so, when the isolationist foreign policy of Japan was still in place for good parts of the 1630s through 1850s, as you see over here. It was, I mean, as many of you know already, um, I don't wanna be preaching at the choir here, but it was like two centuries of continuous lockdown from the rest of the world, basically, marked by massive trade and travel restrictions where Japanese people had little or no idea about what was going on around the world. And not only did that make the Japanese extra hungry for foreign countries and foreign cultures, but also created a kind of a hotbed, if you like, for highly original and unique cultural expressions to develop, particularly among townspeople, ordinary people, especially merchants in big cities like Tokyo and Kyoto. 
And it was during this time where some of the very iconic, some of the most iconic actually Japanese pop culture phenomena were born out of, you know, people's need for entertainment. Of course, the most famous one being ukiyo-e, um, this color layered with blood prints. Needless to say though, ukiyo-e wasn't just born out of the void. There were evidently generations of different visual art styles going back, going back centuries actually, with limited but very powerful foreign influences. <coughs> so for example, this illustration here, um, this book is based on the Western book of fables. That's quite what well, many of you must be really familiar with. These fables were actually first imported by the Portuguese missionaries in the mid 1500s. And this is a very localized and Japanized Aesop's, Aesop's fables. What you're looking at here is actually a very familiar story around here particularly. It's uh, the story of the ants and grasshoppers. But because grasshoppers were very rare back in Japan, back in the 16th century, they just chose to substitute that with a skater. Anyway, many, many visual arts and design practices later, ukiyo-e came, came about in the 17th century as part of the street culture enjoyed by the very common class of the big cities. What was so unique about ukiyo-e wasn't just the style or the way it was produced, you know, with a high degree of division of labor to begin with, with carvers and designers and uh, publishers alike, all working together, just like today's animation studios. But it was also marked by the very way it was exposed to the West through the international expeditions and the way it was later reframed to be highly prized by the foreign audiences. Let me show you what I mean by this. Japan officially made an um, international culture of the beauty, if you like, at the 1873 World Exposition in Vienna, Austria. And that's where the first official selection of ukiyo was juxtaposed for the foreign audiences, along with a whole host of other Japanese traditional crafts, such as the car carpentry tools that are on show uh, over at the Japan site in New York. You can actually see a live site Shachihoku right here. You know, that was brought right from Nagoya Castle actually to the venue. But here, I also want to kind of draw your attention to the fact that there was this one acre of authentic Japanese garden built by Japanese gardeners. And this became Japan's first ever large scale cultural export to the West. This Japanese garden right here was actually purchased after the expo by the Alexandra Park in London, where they created the world's first permanent Japanese theme park with a proper shrine structure surrounded by this Japanese garden. And that became a very popular attraction, popular attraction amongst um, um, people in London. As for ukiyo-e, it is widely known how the art form actually influenced the artistic movement in Europe. And even giants like Claude Monet, Vincent van Gogh, as well as the American uh, female painter, Mary Cassatt, studied very carefully in order to push their own creative angle. The interesting thing here is that ukiyo just like sushi, you know, it was sold and served in food carts as street food. Actually, ukiyo was also part of the street culture, often used as a wrapping paper or, you know, some freebie for groceries and medicines sold by merchants from, say, Toyama Prefecture. But when exposed to foreign markets, this popular, popular art was sort of canonized by and became the kind of collector's item all of a sudden by the uh, Western people, basically, being bought up by private dealers and public museums alike across the Western countries, including the United States, making it part of their high culture. Japanese garden, on the other hand, was interestingly democratized by the West, partly because the curator of Japanese pavilion back in 1873, a German curator, Dr. Wegener, strategically portrayed the Japanese garden as people's park, where townsmen gathered with their families to take a peaceful little stroll for leisure. 
when in fact the strolling bond gardens were you know pretty exclusively reserved for the rich and powerful in japan but because the japanese garden was later bought up by a british leisure park like i was talking about earlier as a community space where ordinary people can enjoy the natural beauty crafted by master craft craftsmen and many other gardens actually follow suit so the garden quickly the, the style of the garden quickly became more, more propagated across Europe and also the United States, particularly after the 1876 uh, Philadelphia Expo, as well as the one in 1893 in Chicago. Today, there are over 250 publicly run Japanese gardens in North America alone. And there are many more, of course, who started in, including private gardens out there, making a whole ecosystem for all things Japanese around the world and made accessible to international audiences from all walks of life, of course. Now, of course, um, you know, Japanese craftsmen and artists are no stranger to refashioning or appropriation of foreign arts and crafts. And this was probably most famously done by Sen Norikyu, the founder of the most influential school of tea in Japan, when he actually re-evaluated and gave a fresh meaning to the neglected everyday utensils and teaware in Korea through this new notion and new narrative of wabi-sabi. The teaware of the common class in Korea became one of the most sought after teawares among the socialites in Japan. And the rest is really history. So isolation often creates this uniqueness, but it's the interconnectedness that takes it to the next level through hybridization. So I'm really definitely looking forward to learning more about you know, all this dynamism from other speakers about how the COVID isolation and 21st century technological connectivity have brought about new cultures and ways to consume them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aki. Professor Nakajima? Okay, yeah, so can you hear me okay? All right, yeah, so thank you, uh, Tsutei Sensei and also Nakanishi-san for providing important, uh, very important and interesting historical background. And I will talk about, as, a little, as many of you may know, Kimetsu no Yaiba, the uh, comic book film and the anime manga, uh, became a huge success in Japan in the midst of COVID-19. So I will start just with, uh, uh, you know, introdu introducing this phenomenal success of Kimetsu no Yaiba and expand it to the discussion of more general response of Japanese pop culture to COVID-19. And doing, in doing so, I'm a sociologist, so I focus on two things. And the first, the industrial product context of production distribution. And second, sociocultural context of consumption and reception of popular culture works. And I don't think I need to introduce Kimetsu no Yaiba's success. Um, I think every, uh, many of you may know, but you know, Kimetsu no Yaiba uh, became the uh, top uh, grossing film uh, when uh, after only, I think, a little more than two months uh, after its release in October 16th, 2020, which was in the midst of COVID-19 crisis. And also just uh, in terms of comic book sale, um, I think it uh, sold like 150 million volumes in, J I mean, Japan uh, alone, I think. And that means more than one volume for all the people in Japan. So it's a very huge success. And first, industrially, how this came about. And, you know, I have to be brief. I have some notes, but I will be brief. And my observation is um, basically, of course, you know, many say success of Kimetsu no Yaiba, this particular anime uh, manga comic work is the uh, result of this extraordinary ordinary situation of uh, COVID-19. You know, people stayed home, people wanted entertainment, and also maybe it, the theme of Kimetsu no Yaiba, uh, like protecting family, perseverance in the midst of crisis, these things resonated with Japanese uh, culture, maybe these are their arguments. But my observation is a bit more general, so a bit um, different from this very, you know, COVID-19 focused explanation. And my argument is basically Kimetsu no Yaiba's success was a very unique manifestation during COVID-19, condensed manifestation, but over no generalizable trends that have been going on in Japanese anime and popular culture production for a long time. And I don't uh, need to go over, and I think uh, 
other speakers will be talking about this issue maybe in more detail. But just for example, uh, this success of Kimetsu no Aeba was a very typical so-called media mix uh, strategy, producing contents in a variety of media formats, such as serialized comics, independent comic books, uh, published comic books, uh, TV, anime, uh, film, spin-out novels, and also product tie-ups. And you know, as you, many of you may know, Kimetsu no Yaiba is a, a serialized um, comic in uh, Shonen Jump, the magazine, weekly magazine. And also it has you know, independently published pub, uh, comic book as, uh, as themselves. And also TV animation broadcast, and then you know the film became very really popular. So and also the song uh, of Kimetsu no Yaiba theme song, uh, sung by Lisa, was very popular. You know even before COVID nineteen, Lisa appeared in Kohaku Utagasen, which is the nationally popular end of the year music uh, program. I think she appeared for the first time in December two thousand nineteen. So I would say, of course. Uh, it is very uh, made possible, uh, this success was made possible because of this special situation. But, um, you know, it manifested a very generalizable trend that has been going on in Japanese popular culture, anime production for a long time, but again, appeared in the context form. And, you know, for example, during COVID-19, there were not very many competition in film theaters, so mm -hmm. uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba film could uh, occupy lots of screens. And even Toho, um, I think, announced this uh, strategy called Chou Kakudai Haikyuu, so kind of super expanded distribution. Because that was possible because of COVID-19 uh, and no competitors, film theaters wanting to show films, but no uh, other works coming out. So the Kimetsu no Yaiba can occupy the many number of screens and also film theaters, right? So again, you know, for the first industrial context, I would argue very, you know, of course, COVID-19 has, was a really interesting, uh, had very uh, good, big impact on the popular cultural response and especially for the Kimetsu no Yaiba success. But at the same time, probably we need to straight this in a more generalizable trend that has been going on mixed media strategy and also very careful windowing of comic book production, maybe uh, TV, anime uh, airing, and then Netflix viewing, and then film, and then another second season of TV, anime uh, production. So this is my first argument. And the second thing, I think I, at the time is made this, I was talk just a little bit about the socio-cultural context of reception. And again, you know, you could say, basically just explain again this from the perspective of COVID-19 by saying it resonated with traditional Japanese culture, onitaiji story, demon thing story, long history in Japan. So basically you can kind of talk about this reflected deep mind of Japanese people. And that's, I think, partly true, right? But at the same time, maybe Kimetsu no success, I, my argument on the second aspect would be um, the key thing was very clear. So Kimetsu no Yaiba, even title shows it's Kimetsu, so oni, ki, uh, demon, metsu mean killing, right? And with a sword. So story has a very, um, the Kimetsu no Yaiba itself had a very simple, understandable key theme. But I noticed many people had, you know, critical opinions about this, maybe uh, over emphasis on following orders, but also many people liked it. And many people talked about just visual, you know, how beautiful anime animated uh, film was, animated series was. And also some people, of course, talk, talked about the kind of national reception, uh, the resonation with the Japanese culture, uh, onitaiji story, folklore, and uh, the historically, you know, that kind of cultural uh, res uh, resonation. But also we could, of course, say this really resonated with people's loneliness in the time of COVID-19, importance of spending time with family, protecting your sisters, brothers, and uh, even, you know, kind of how to deal with uh, this isolation of perseverance, right? So again, you know, my argument, I, I will end uh, here. So uh, as a socialist, I would say very industrially, productively in the production and distribution, it was a very interesting, unique manifestation of generalized trend. And in terms of social cultural reception, it was uh, the, the source of success was, had the key theme, but allowed variety of interpretations, you know, contemporary connection, historical connection, industrial explanation, textual explanation, visual narrative. So again, you know, one of the sources of success of uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba was, a, that, that was because uh, it had very uh, kind of uh, key theme everyone can relate to, but also allowed a variety of interpretations responses. And yeah, that would be uh, my uh, short uh, introduction. Okay. And I think uh, um, 
next speaker will be talking more about the uh, general uh, phenomena related to Japanese pop popular culture. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Nakajima. I will admit to being a Demon Slayer fan, uh, mm -hmm. and I am excited to see the movie when it comes to the right. States. Yeah. Roland. Sorry, ohayou gozaimasu. Good morning from Tokyo. Uh, it was wonderful listening to th those two presentations and uh, Bill's high-spirited introduction. And it's an honor to be uh, included in this panel. Uh, I want to thank uh, Japan Society and Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, and I guess the Japan America Society of Oregon for, uh, for supporting this. Um, I was fascinated listening to both uh, Nakanishi -san, Nakanishi-san's and Nakajima-san's uh, presentations, and I thought I would try to connect them to what I'm going to say. Um, it was interesting thinking about uh, the two centuries of lockdown uh, in Japan, the Sakoku period, a closed country, when so many, actually so many creative arts flourished inside Japan. It's almost... Um, antithetical to our idea of globalization. We tend to think in the 21st century that globalization and the exchange of cultures is going to produce uh, all kinds of innovation and creativity. But in fact, in Japan, as Nakanishi-san points out, although there were some foreign influences, of course, uh, Japan's uh, native cultures really uh, flourished and advanced. And I thought that was interesting in terms of the pandemic, of course, uh, where uh, Japan, like the rest of the world, was more or less cut off from, uh, at least from travel and tourism. Uh, and yet, arguably, um, the anime and manga industries, uh, Japanese pop culture in particular, uh, did very, very well uh, over the past year. Uh, Nakajima-san talks about the enormous, literally record-breaking success of Kimetsu no Yaiba, Demon Slayer, uh, in a time when people were largely locked inside, they still went to the cinema, uh, even if they couldn't eat popcorn. Uh, they went to see it um, in record numbers. The other thing I thought was quite interesting was uh, Nakanishi-san talking about isolation and hybridization. So while this pandemic and COVID-19 has certainly uh, shut down the borders, um, we see an increasing number of co-productions in the anime industry uh, where uh, uh, non-Japanese companies, particularly streaming platforms like Netflix, but other produ production companies in Los Angeles and London are working together with Japanese anime studios to create co-productions, sort of a new hybridization uh, in the anime industry, and that's grown dramatically over the past year, despite the pandemic. Everybody's been doing Zoom meetings like this and, and connecting across uh, the internet to co-create uh, and hybridize. Um, and I'm gonna go to my slides now, um, which are fairly uh, basic, but I think help make the two points I wanna make. Um, this year, the, the big story in Japanese pop culture, uh, as I mentioned, is the success of streaming media. And I just wanted to put this slide up there at the beginning. A lot of people don't realize, and this I have to thank my friend, Larry Mall, who's here in Tokyo, who uh, has worked uh, for Warner uh, and also for Sony. And Larry pointed me to this, which is that Japan uh, is has 11 of the top 25 highest grossing media franchises of all time. 11 of 25, and Japan is the only non-English speaking country represented on that list. So we're talking about multi-billion dollar uh, franchises, identifiable franchises. So uh, like the uh, McDonald's arches, you can identify them right away. And um, just showing you in the top Six there, you have uh, Pokemon and Hello Kitty in the top two slots, and you just uh, ahead of Star Wars and Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh, and then Ampaman down there in number six. Uh, the slide's too long, too big to show you the all 11, but it's quite a striking uh, image. Over here we have uh, the anime industry, the latest report from uh, the Association of Japanese Animation, 
And you can see that since 2012, where there was a bit of a lull, partly because of the uh, Tohoku earthquake disasters, uh, things really skyrocketed in the anime industry and have continued to soar each year, uh, rising above the year before. And quite dramatically, that's the inflection point after 212, uh, you really see things accelerate. And if we go to the next slide, um, you will see that um, the light blue there is representing uh, overseas sales, uh, which has, that, no, that number has grown most dramatically. But one of the surprises in 2019, and I interviewed people from the Association of Japanese Animations, they were quite surprised at how strong domestic sales have uh, continued, how robust the domestic sales in anime have been. And one of the reasons I was told was that um, there's just such an age range now for the anime viewer in Japan. So you have little kids who are uh, into Anpanman, the title I mentioned earlier, uh, and they estimate, the uh, AJA estimates, all the, all the way up into Japanese in their 60s, uh, who are ardent anime fans, not necessarily otaku, not necessarily obsessive, but who will go to the cinema, for example, to see Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba, or will go to the cinema to see uh, Evangelion, which uh, the, the latest uh, iteration of that franchise was released, I think, just last week or two weeks ago. And uh, first weekend took in 30 million uh, or so at the box office uh, again in the middle of a pandemic, uh, which, is, which is a huge number. Um, so the, the domestic audience is robust. And uh, the AJA uh, points out that, uh, again, streaming media has helped drive this too. Um, Last year, Netflix, some of you may know there's a, a Netflix did anime series a couple of years ago, uh, Rilakuma and uh, Sumiko Gurashi, both by the characters created by a company called San X, not Sanrio, but San X. And those series really boomed inside Japan and helped uh, sell a lot of merchandise. So this is sort of the business side I'm talking about. We can go to the next slide. And uh, this is showing um, actually manga sales in North America in 220. And as you can see, graphic novels overall uh, showed growth, but manga just shot through the roof. And part of that reason, again, is the sort of the streaming version of manga or digital manga. Uh, digital manga sales surpassed print sales for the first time in Japan in 2017. And of course, overseas, they're doing gangbusters. And uh, there are a lot of, now, a lot of legitimate high quality manga reading apps available, including uh, Mangamo is one that uh, you may have heard of. Uh, and manga has some distinct advantages as an ebook style format because uh, rather than a novel where you're constantly trying to uh, maybe enlarge the type just to, to read it. Uh, with manga, you can actually enlarge the graphics and look very carefully at the artwork. Um, and you can sort of indulge in some ways on a deeper level than you might be able to with print. So manga too had a great year in 2020. Uh, I should add that the sales inside Japan also went up by 23%. Um, so the industry, the manga industry inside Japan saw record sales in 2020. They're, the number is 43% in North America and 23% inside Japan. Um, so since 1978, when they started assessing those sales, uh, manga had a record year inside Japan. The next slide uh, will focus on uh, the, the, the big story uh, in Japanese pop culture this year, which was uh, online media. and. Uh, Crunchyroll, which some of you may know, started actually as uh, something of a <laughs> something of a pirate site back in 2006. Uh, then went legitimate, legitimately licensing titles uh, by 2008, 2009, 
and now is a very, very big company, and it is totally dedicated to anime, unlike Netflix. Netflix does, as, as you know, all kinds of different content categories. Netflix hit 4 million paid subscribers, and at the same time, roughly the same time, was purchased by Sony for $1.2 billion. This happened at the end of 2020. So in the pandemic year, Sony is clearly looking to expand its online presence, its streaming presence, uh, and particularly expand it in the form of anime. So anime streaming was one reason uh, that Japanese pop culture, one of the ways Japanese pop culture responded to the COVID situation. Fans certainly, uh, uh, you know, fans drove the online interest. Um, and I should add Netflix itself reported that uh, last year, uh, anime viewership grew by 50%. Uh, their, their statistics show that anime was in the top 10 viewing list in over 100 countries uh, that Netflix serves. Uh, and uh, that's uh, apparently a record 100 million households watching anime. So it's not just uh, streaming content that grew in popularity, but anime in particular exploded in the streaming realm. And the next slide, this is a phenomenon that uh, some of you may know, know about. Um, it's called anime VTubing. Uh, YouTubers are, of course, people who make their own videos uh, on YouTube, and they're usually quite entertaining, sometimes as tailored to a specific subject. Well, VTubing is virtual YouTubing, and the character is an anime avatar. And um, this character you're seeing here is named Kizuna Ai. And she is the most popular anime VTubing avatar at, uh, at the moment. Um, actually started, uh, was, was, so I should say she launched in 2016, but 2020 was really a banner year for the character and for lots of other anime VTubers anime VTubers, excuse me. Um, so this is interesting, going back to one of uh, Nakanishi-san's comments about a sense of community in the garden and so on, because actually uh, I've, I've been doing some research into VTubing and talking to people who are on the creative side and who are on the fan side, and it really is a sense of community that drives the popularity of these characters. And in fact, um, the people behind Kizuna Ai told me that uh, they started to subtitle her performances in English because there were so many English language fans commenting on her uh, videos. This is also, I should mention, a profitable enterprise. Um, on YouTube, you can, you can uh, donate through a service called Super Chat, um, which is, uh, allows you to donate a certain amount of money so that your chat comments rise to the top. And since August of uh, 2020, uh, the top 10, uh, top 10 donation numbers uh, and profitable donation numbers are occupied by anime VTubers. These are anime characters that host shows and interact with fans in live streams. On uh, the next slide, we'll show you this uh, idea of hybridization. This was a live event, Hello World 2020. That is uh, Kizuna Ai performing uh, with actual human beings on a stage, uh, musicians. But uh, of course, because of COVID, there was no audience there, but it went out, it was beamed out um, online and was hugely uh, successful. So this is a hybrid event with an anime character, real people, and going out on a live stream uh, online. So we can go to the next slide. I just want to mention, you know, people are often asking me about the appeal of anime. And aside from the obvious, some of it is beautifully drawn. Some of the stories are really gripping and surprising, the aesthetics of it. Uh, there's also what I, I, I found really interesting, which was uh, uh, one of the Netflix staff who has worked in the industry for a long time, used this phrase, anime tribes. And what he meant by that was that the characters travel really well uh, from country to country, from, from culture to culture, because they're anime characters. So for example, yeah, very popular actors, uh, real people, 
uh, or rock stars in one country may not be known at all in another country. Uh, one example is uh, Oprah Winfrey, who everybody knows in, in North America. Um, she hosted an interview with the Royals uh, recently. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, on Japanese television, they were trying to explain who she was because Oprah Winfrey is just not known over here. Whereas if you're an anime character, this, uh, this uh, staffer said at, at Netflix, uh, you know, if you're Goku or, or Sailor Moon character, you're, you're immediately absorbed by the local culture. Maybe, uh, maybe the character speaks in your language when you watch the show, but Goku is Goku in Sao Paulo. Goku is Brazilian in Sao Paulo. Goku is, is Spanish in Spain. Goku is, uh, you know, home in Nebraska, <laughs> speaking English. So these anime characters, anime tribes really travel well across borders. And that makes it a great uh, category uh, for streaming media. And then the final slide, I'll just quickly talk about uh, anime tourism. Uh, of course, that was hampered by the pandemic and still is hampered by the pandemic, but it is a growing uh, um, field. And uh, now you have sort of two basic categories, anime pilgrimages. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's actually a, a unit called Anime Pilgrimage 88 that gives you 88 sites, guides you to 88 sites featured in anime. Um, and then there's a kind of like anime hunting where you go out on your own in Japan and look for sites. And the reason I mention this is I think the anime VTubers kind of made up a little bit for the inability of people to travel to Japan. They could at least interact with a Japanese anime character, hear Japanese spoken, uh, comment back, feel like they were engaged with anime when you couldn't go to cons and you couldn't actually come to Japan. So there's a kind of anime tourism that was happening uh, online. Um, but anime tourism is, is really a growing uh, market. And of course, tourism to Japan was exploding just prior to the pandemic. And people expected it to uh, skyrocket this summer for the uh, uh, Tokyo Olympics. Uh, of course, that's going to be very, very different. Um, but I think that's part of pop culture's appeal in COVID-19, Japanese pop culture's appeal, is that it gave people a sense that they were still visiting or engaging with Japan and, and having an interaction with the culture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Roland. Thank you to all three uh, of our panelists. That was fascinating. I learned so many things. The idea of Sakoku as lockdown was wonderful. Uh, and I never uh, had heard the term super extended distribution or VTubing before. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Let me just start by uh, asking uh, you. Uh, as, as I think we all know, the pandemic has uh, disrupted uh, live action television and film production around the globe. Uh, how has the Japanese entertainment industry responded? And I think, uh, importantly, uh, perhaps especially for this audience, uh, has the pipeline in animation been able to continue uh, through this uh, pandemic? Or are we going to see a drought uh, uh, at some point uh, in new productions appearing? Nakajima Sensei, do you want to start okay, yeah, on that? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, true in the sense in anime, basically, you can uh, digitally draw the anime or manga works and then send through internet. So uh, remote work is quite, you know, conducive to anime production. And also many of the anime uh, people who make anime are freelancers. So they are used to, you know, working individually or among the uh, relatively small number of people. So definitely, I think compared to like a drama in Japan, some of the real uh, drama was production was disrupted, um, airing, postponed, um, delayed uh, for because production was disrupted. But anime, I haven't seen that kind of, uh, so it, it, I think anime adapted because of its technology very well to the COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, I also heard different parts of anime production were affected kind of differently in the sense, for example, voice, voice acting, voice um, recording, you need, you know, of course, in regular ordinary times, you gather in one place and record voices, but because of COVID-19, voice actors needed to record them individually. So there was some delay in voice acting. While that may actually um, kind of forced people working on the 
the actual drawing to speed up their work. So they became even more busier than uh, regular time. So I think, yeah, it's true. Anime really you know, responded to COVID-19 very well in terms of production, but also has differential impacts depending on which uh, part of the, uh, the work they are involved in. Yeah, that's my like a brief response. Great, any other comments on that? Yeah, I would just I, you know, second everything that uh, Nakajima-san, uh, Nakajima Sensei said there, and the um, you know the voice acting was really one of the biggest challenges. But one thing that surprised me, uh, and I think this might be uh, the impact of 311, oddly enough, of what happened during the earthquake and tsunami. Um, you know, a lot of distribution lines were disrupted uh, back then in 2011. A lot of studios uh, suffered. Some actually had to either uh, combine uh, or or close. And I think, oddly enough, that by 2020, because the studios had gone through that, they were able to adapt much faster to the state of emergency that was uh, originally called in April. There was a lot of fear back then that this was going to be like 2011 in the anime industry. And that really didn't happen. A lot of shows were postponed or delayed, but people kept working. And as Nakajima Sensei says, they were able to work remotely much more efficiently than back in 2011. So a combination of that experience, and of course the technology now is much better um, and more people have access to it. Roland, do you see other lessons learned from 311 affecting the Japanese media industry? Uh, are there ways in particular that you think they might have uh, learned how to address uh, uh, a stressful and traumatic time like the one we're going through from what happened a decade ago? I think so. I mean, I think the entire industry is much more agile now than it was back then. Um, it is also more um, efficient. Uh, the old production committees used to be huge back in 2011. You have 10 or 12 companies. And now, uh, of course, especially with the influence again of Netflix and other big uh, non-Japanese media companies coming in, now you have maybe three companies. Kimetsu no Yaiba is a great example. There are only three companies behind the production of Kimetsu no Yaiba. So things happen much more efficiently. And I think it's not just 311, but al also the changing of the guard. <laughs> to be honest. I mean, a lot of people from Hayao Miyazaki's generation are retiring or have retired, uh, are no longer active in the industry. And now you have, you know, you have uh, people in their 40s and 50s who know how to use the technology and know that anime is popular. It's not a surprise to them and know that there's a way to deliver it to a global audience. So I think the changing of the guard is also important uh, in the past 10 years. You know, one of the things I thought was interesting is seeing the success of Demon Slayer. And I think Professor Nakajima talked about this very well. That of course was something that was conceived before the pandemic began. And it just happened to resonate during this moment. Do you think content creators are going to address the pandemic in specific ways uh, in products that are uh, being uh, uh, made right now? Uh, do you have any sense of how that might play out? Professor Nakajima? Oh, OK. Yeah, and of course, you know, difficult to foresee what kind of anime production will be coming out. But yeah, so definitely, I think, you know, there may be and Japan has some tradition of dealing with uh, pandemic in popular culture production. And one is Kansen, uh, I forgot the title, but one film in like 2009, Kansen, Netto maybe, you know, they dealt with this issue. So yeah, definitely maybe coming out. But the other point would be, I, I don't know what other people think, but you know, Japanese animation, not every animation, but has lots of you know, many works that we was, if not like a virus and pandemic mix, but kind of crisis situations and you know of course different reading could be possible evangelion is that you know it's kind of very uh like an impact first impact second impact the crisis for the human being and even shingeki no kyojin which is also another anime manga production isolated in the walls and in a very you know crisis situation so i think in general japanese popular culture depicted many situations of crisis uh, if not pandemic. So I think, yeah, this kind of tradition will continue. But of course, I cannot foresee what kind of particular works will be coming out um, on this particular uh, phenomenon of COVID-19. Yeah. 
Thank you. You know, uh, uh, in uh, the United States and Europe, of course, we've seen mm. a lot of coverage uh, of the difficulties the pandemic has caused mm. uh, for traditional high culture, uh, for symphony orchestras, uh, mm. for operas, for museums, uh, and so forth. And I wonder, uh, uh, how have more traditional forms of culture, theater, sumo, gardens, museums, uh, fared in Japan uh, during this time? And what kind of innovations uh, might they have come up with uh, to respond uh, to the needs uh, of their audiences? Uh, Aki? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I was saying, you know, how long do you have for this question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can quickly talk about three areas, I guess, namely um, museums, theater, especially Kabuki, mm -hmm. and another one, sumo. The well, museums, you know, um, what I can see in the museums, uh, museum landscape during the lockdown is completely in line with the rest of the world, actually, being forced to close and countless temporary layoffs and shuttered visitations, you know, less programming, more virtual programs ranging from like uh, virtual tours and remote film screening, online workshops, along with, uh, you know, various webinars of many, many times, uh, types actually. And they are very common across the board, but the uh, situation of course is pretty dire across the industry, but a lot of um, museums, especially smaller and uh, more nimble municipal and private museums are taking this opportunity as a kind of, a, you know, opportunity to reassess who they are and what their core competences might be. So kind of steering away from say, you know, decade long model based on big and expensive blockbuster shows, usually from abroad in order to just draw crowds. So the key word here, I think is local and more collaboration and triangulation with other similar organizations. You know, for example, there was an interesting exhibition of uh, Western modern art them thematically and virtually linked in three municipal art museums in Yokohama. Uh, I think it was Toyama and Aichi actually, leveraging their respective kind of resources to, you know, um, come up with something very unique for visitors while also increasing you know, regional tourism, uh, a bit like what uh, Roland was alluding to earlier, but across those cities as well. And very interestingly, the more traditional uh, forms of entertainment, particularly sumo and kabuki, you know, kabuki is a traditional theatrical performance. Again, it's one of the products of the isolationist policy period actually, are going incredibly well. Of course, the situation has been dire for both of these industries, you know, having gone through pretty much everything you know, from post closure performances without any spectators in st stadiums and auditoriums, operating at 25%, 30%, 50% capacity. But in case of Kabuki, uh, which was understandably very reserved in terms of digitization and tended to lag very much behind the latest technologies for the, all the right reasons, they actually started live streaming the entire production for the first month of closure, actually in March last year, completely free of charge on YouTube. And a handful of active and, you know, go-getter types of younger Kabuki actors in their thirties and forties are actually definitely focused more on digital productions and distribution as well. Especially, uh, namely, you know, Matsumoto Koshiro, Oichikawa Ennosuke, both of whom actually come from a very prominent lineage of uh, Kabuki families going back a few hundred years. And those actors actually started producing uh, Kabuki stage using Zoom, <laughs> mixing recorded and live footage for free distribution. And it's proving to be gaining momentum as well and expanding audiences across the segments that Kabuki traditionally kind of had little exposure to. They also just teamed up with uh, you know, Amazon Prime to start streaming their more regular comedy series. It's actually called Zoom Kabuki, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing their <laughs> premiere in April. And Sumo is equally intriguing actually, running now at 50% uh, 50, 50 capacity. Some outside the box kind of thinkers in the industry have seen some silver lining in this situation in a very unique way, in that they have been able to identify, you know, core fan base because of the series of lockdowns. 
the, the series of lockdown, lockdowns have actually, again, almost functioned as a screening process to identify who comes to soon, no matter what. So some industry experts actually say those who dropped out the game, you know, soon after lockdown, are these soft business, you know, soft users, soft, uh, I guess, uh, uh, fans who are just coming to the show to meet with the wrestlers and eat and drink in the pavilion or take their clients out for entertainment. So the Sumo Association actually targeting at the core audience, uh, core audiences rather, they've launched a series of new ideas, both analog and digital. But of course, because of time, I'm just gonna touch on the digital portion, given the topic of today's discussion as well, but it's pretty amazing. It's, uh, if I can just quickly um, share my screen to actually show you this. Um, they have the association. <laughs> They have actually come up with a new mobile app and that lets um, fans collect trading cards of all listed wrestlers digitally. And of course the rare ones are only accessible when they actually come to the game in person, you know, to the stadium. This lets people in fandom kind of trade cards, create virtual battles against different cards and down the road, they are also thinking about letting users actually create and nurture their own, a bit like Tamagotchi actually, create and nurture their own wrestlers, their own wrestlers, and partially fight against the kind of avatars of real wrestlers, all in this cyberspace. So this is uh, kind of part of how they are keeping the fandom intact and engaged uh, during this uh, you know, global pandemic. And I keep hearing from, you know, especially from young people that, they cannot wait to get back to the stadium when it gets back to kind of semi-normal. So um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's taking place actually in response to COVID-19. Uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much. That is just uh, fascinating. There are a huge number of questions from the audience, which I'm not surprised about. But before we get to that, I just want to ask you very, very quickly uh, one uh, question for each panelist. Uh, look into your crystal balls for me. Uh, can you share your thoughts about the future of Japanese popular culture over, say, the next five years or so? Uh, what kind of lasting impact do you think uh, the pandemic uh, might have on the Japanese media industry and the global profile uh, of Japanese entertainment? Roland, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, I can speak uh, to a couple of, of points. Uh, one is that I think uh, what I mentioned earlier, the increasing number of co-productions in the anime industry, that's going to continue to expand. Um, Netflix in particular is pouring a lot of money in, but all uh, companies in China are as well. And I think what you're going to see emerging is, um, is a, a kind of fractured uh, <laughs> or categorical approach where some fans will be uh, devotees, kind of like uh, Nakanishi-san was saying about the sumo industry, and they will only want to watch what they might consider pure anime, made in Japan by Japanese artists, 2D, not 3D, not too much CG, mostly the classic look of Japanese anime. And then there will be a broader audience, maybe a softer audience that likes all kinds of anime and they'll, they, they might, uh, what you might call hybrid anime uh, or, or co-produced anime. And that will become its own category. I think that will become a separate category. And uh, the fans are already becoming more uh, careful about their distinctions between an anime that's produced in 3D with international artists versus an anime produced at a, a smaller anime studio. The other thing I should mention, and this, this just happened quite recently, uh, Netflix just announced that they have leased two uh, studio uh, sound stages uh, from Toho Studios. Mm -hmm. And they are planning to push the live action production in Japan. And you know they, they've had some success with live action dramas on Netflix uh, produced in Japan with Japanese actors and Japanese uh, artists and directors. Um, I think Naked Director is probably one that most people have heard of, uh, but there's uh, right now there's a big uh, uh, samurai documentary 
on Netflix that's apparently doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I talked to them last time, they said, we're not just pushing anime. We really want to push Japanese live action and, and, and get some real money behind these productions because they believe that the creativity is here. The ideas, the stories, the performers are here in Japan. They just need to get them out. Fantastic. Nakajima sensei, any thoughts looking forward? Okay. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it will be, you know, I think it's a good time for Japanese popular culture, both live action and anime. You know, anime could respond to COVID-19 situation very effectively. And also Netflix, rise of subscription economy in general, you know, the Jap live action drama like Imawa no Kuni no Arisu, which was popular in Japan, but also becoming popular worldwide. So I think it's our uh, future is bright. Uh, that's one observation. And on the other side, because I'm a sociologist, I sometimes you know want to be critical. And the other side would be, it may kind of uh, increase divide between the winners and losers. And both in terms of like, for example, I have friends who are doing research on small live houses, music live houses, and they are really having a hard time. Many of them are closing down small mini theaters, film theaters, mm -hmm. but it's not doing well while big theaters are really, you know, surviving and thriving. Mm -hmm. And also Sony is a very interesting example. I don't know if it is a good thing or bad thing, and depending on the perspective, but very, you know, concentration powers in the hands of big players like Sony buying up Crunchyroll. And also in extension, actually Sony produced a first electric autonomous, um, not um, starting to sell, but uh, announced as automobile too. And the you know, purpose is to basically in the aid of autonomous driving, you don't need to drive, then what people do, watch anime, film, listen to music in the car, right? So again, that kind of divide uh, winners, losers may intensify and that may be um, not necessarily always a good thing. So that's my observation. Wonderful. Yeah. Aki, any words of uh, foresight? Well, yeah, first and foremost, I guess I feel very fortunate coming from a garden and culture organization to say that all the outdoor facilities in general, I mean, you know, parks, arboretums, forestry centers and gardens have been thriving under these lockdown situations. And because people actually find it more comfortable and probably safer than some of the enclosed public spaces. And um, people are discovering the richness of nature and what it can actually bring to the community and themselves in terms of physical activities and health in general. Um, that is true both in the United States and Japan and probably beyond too. And down the road, like everyone else, we'll be, well, as a garden, we'll be seeing a far greater uh, degree and number of hybrid models going forward mixing virtual experience with tangibles and in-person experience. And because we are a physical space, we can be and uh, we are actually a cultural platform for any form of art, uh, including popular culture. In fact, we would be a perfect place for, you know, any Demon Slayer themed cosplay or <laughs> exhibition or, you know, some sort of fun educational programs to go deeper on things featured in that anime. I mean, we have, uh, you know, like Wisteria Arbor, you know, Castle Wall, uh, and the gardens and the whole nine years. So, but that aside, um, Japan is a huge creative engine of the world for sure. But it's very peculiar. And sometimes that's better when faced with adversity um, to create positive output. And as long as the current pace of global integration, as Roland was, you know, alluding to earlier, as long as this global integration continues to open up um, Japanese media in general, the whole ecosystem of anime and manga productions, I'm quite sure the popular content will continue to be one of the, one of the country's best exports going forward too. But, and as a lot of observers do point out, you know, Japan is not great at really reimagining itself, especially if it requires rocking the boat or stirring the pot a little bit to change. But, Sometimes the stirring of the pot is needed to grow out of that complacency because that could make highbrow culture more accessible and by the same token, elevate popular culture to high art. And to that very end, while I can't really predict the future, you know, I, I am quite sure that the role played by external experts like this panel, of course, including your very self, Professor Tutsui, will continue to grow in its importance and impact going forward. That's my kind of two cents. Wonderful. 
Got a number of great questions here. Let me just start with a very broad one uh, for you. Uh, how would you contrast the globalization of Japanese popular culture with that of China, including Hong Kong and Taiwan, Korea and India? Are there aspects of the spread of Japanese popular culture that have made its spread distinct from that of other Asian sources? Uh, and I guess one question would be, has it changed during the pandemic uh, in any meaningful way? Hmm. I think maybe Nakajima sensei would be well placed to answer okay, this question. Yeah, so yeah, I, maybe, yeah. And again, yeah, I don't have like immediate answers here, but you know, as um, these, the trend in using internet and, you know, globalization is definitely making different uh, popular culture from different Asian countries uh, spread to in uh, different parts to different parts of the world, like K-pop use, you know, K K-pop music, their use of SNS, uh, internet, YouTube, and maybe a little bit, uh, how, do you, how, how do you say, the softer uh, control of property rights and uh, copyright that is, you know, definitely benefited the popular, rise in popularity of K-pop culture. So I think that kind of thing's happening, like use of YouTube, use of SNS by Japanese companies and anime production. So in general, I think these technologies, you know, emerging technologies, is pushing um, Asian popular culture in a positive direction. So that's one thing. But yeah, other than that, yeah, I don't know much about the uh, Korean popular culture and Chinese popular culture and animation, actually the size of the production is very big. And I don't think I have time to uh, discuss this much, but Chinese government is really pushing toward promoting domestic production of Chinese animation and even cosplay exhibition, it used to be more like people are wearing Japanese cosplay, but they are promoting like a national popular culture production. So that may become in terms of size, very influential, but again, you know, because of different issues, Chinese popular culture hasn't been really popular. Their soft power strategy hasn't been really successful abroad for many uh, different reasons. But again, you know, I think they are, I think, you know, one of the dynamics areas the most dynamic areas in terms of popular culture production export exchange is definitely Asia, including Korea, uh, Japan, and Taiwan. And I, I think I, that's uh, what I can say for now. Roland, any insights on that? Yeah, just a quick sort of broad insight, but um, comparatively, especially if you're comparing the Korean K-pop industry to Japanese uh, music industry or even the anime industry, comparatively, um, the appeal of Japanese popular culture has, has been demand driven. In other words, it hasn't been because Japan promoted it very effectively or poured money into promotion or advertised. It's because audiences all over the world have demanded more pop culture from Japan. By comparison, the Korean pop industry is very aggressive. And they, a lot of, most of the people I've met in the industry speak English. Uh, they fly to LA, they fly to New York, they have meetings there. They're very conscious of producing pop music that appeals to a Western market. Uh, so they study the recording techniques in Los Angeles and bring back beats to Seoul and have exchanges and K-pop artists will record in a studio in Los Angeles. By comparison, Japan is still a sakoku, you know, closed country <laughs> by comparison. And you know, the Japanese pop music industry is still largely content to sell to Japanese. And um, a lot of it, a lot of the hit songs are still sort of modeled on, uh, on karaoke. So, you know, a song that Japanese people can want to sing when they go to karaoke, uh, whereas K-pop is more liable to be focused on dance clubs around the world and wanting to get people to, uh, to internationally to buy into Korean pop music. Again, that's a broad brush stroke, but I think there, that is kind of a key difference. Um, that leads nicely into a question asked by Fred Katayama, who many of you may know could teach us all a lot about uh, business uh, in Japan. Uh, and Fred asks, could the popularity of any new developments in Japanese pop culture lose part of their audience when Japan and the world return to normalcy? Uh, in the U.S., stocks of companies like Zoom and exercise bike maker Peloton are dropping as investors fear demand will drop. Roland, what do you think? 
Well, uh, I can, uh, that's a great question from Fred. And I can uh, say that <laughs> I've been talking about Japanese VTubing, uh, but just uh, the November, December of last year, an American VTubing company started up in California and introduced eight characters, uh, VTubers who look anime-like, but are very American in their behavior and in their attitudes. They're a bit snarky. They're not, they're not as kawaii as the Japanese characters. So yeah, clearly something like VTubing, which exploded in Japan, uh, now it's gonna, be, it's gonna be produced elsewhere. And somebody else might take the idea and, and run away with a, a huge success. So that's, but I mean, I think that's that. That's always the possibility. I mean, you you know, yeah. And manga, something like manga has been around for so long. And as you saw from the graph I put up, manga sales just spiked uh, in North America and in Japan beyond graphic novel sales. So there's still something about manga made by Japanese artists primarily that is distinctive from graphic novels from all over the world. Um, so there's still, you know, there's still an appeal that is distinctly Japanese. Other comments on that? I could be slightly lengthy here, but uh, you know, I would also bring up uh, a topic of like craftsmanship that could never quite be emulated by, you know, in a short period of time by other countries, I guess. Although a lot of Japanese craftsmen or Japanese, you know, animators are not really self-conscious about how much of high degree of, uh, you know, um, skills that they possess necessarily, because they don't really compare themselves to the outside market. So that's their kind of advantage, but at the same time, you know, real disadvantage. I've got a little kind of an anecdote about you know, some high-ranking State Department officer who went into a you know, meeting with a Studio Ghibli uh, leadership to exchange views and ideas on the continued collaboration and, you know, actual co cooperation in the protection of IPR, especially where it pertains to some global new powers and new markets. So while there was a shared vision for the industry-wide protection against piracy of all copyrighted materials, there was a clear difference in the reasons why the protection was needed in the first place. The US side was clearly coming from the kind of uh, profit maximization standpoint. While Studio Ghibli, although it's not representative of, uh, of all of the animation studios in Japan, but was more focused on avoiding, you know, disservice to the artists and producers by allowing piracy overseas. So in this kind of interesting dialogue between the top officials from uh, US and uh, one of the leading figures from Studio Ghibli that I started on um, a few years ago, the US top official pretty much emphasized the importance of profit maximization to keep business sustainable and production going. The American side said to the Studio Ghibli leaders, um, we need to ensure constant stream of revenues through dig digitization and everything. Um, wherever is possible, but uh, because the, the rationale obviously was because when, where there's no revenues, that means no production, and that means not being able to keep staff. But Ghibli's answer was, no, 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 no. No new ideas means no new production. So staff can, you know, can go work elsewhere in the meantime until the next new ideas come up. So. You know, there's that kind of a, a, a massive kind of cultural difference in approach to the production in the first place. So I don't know if even if uh, the ecosystem changes, you know, dramatically to the virtual world, I don't know if that mentality is going to shift that, you know, drastically within a short period of time. Now, there are a couple questions here. This will be the last question from the audience, I'm afraid. And I, uh, I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. But several people are concerned about the future uh, of pop culture tourism uh, and whether uh, people will be going back to Japan uh, again anytime soon. And I wonder what you think uh, the future of that is. Uh, is the Japanese tourism industry going to pick up? Uh, is it going to be a V-shaped uh, recovery for Japanese tourism? Or is it going to take longer to, to bounce back? Roland, do you want to give it a shot? Well, I mean, I, I think it's going to, it's going to spike very quickly as soon as people can return to Japan. You know, it's not, not just anime tourism, of course, but 
but the image of Japan for most people overseas is of a very safe country with a beautiful natural landscape and a very strong public infrastructure. And one of the things we've seen in the pandemic is that countries that do not have a strong public infrastructure uh, have largely failed to protect their citizens. So I think the image of Japan as a safe place, a clean place, a good public infrastructure, that's not going to go away after the pandemic. And anime tourism, you know, what, one, I'll just quickly make this point, but uh, this, again, this is a broad, broad generaliza generaliza generalization, but a, a lot of anime, the sort of classic anime of the 80s and even into the 90s that made big hits, became big hits overseas, they featured settings that were, you know, kind of space age or a, to a dystopic to Tokyo with, you know, like Akira, the ginormous buildings and so on. But a lot of more recent anime in the 21st century have really depicted a quite realistic Japan. Uh, you know, I showed that uh, uh, image, which is obviously from Shinkai Makoto, who's one of the most popular uh, anime directors alive right now, a younger director. And he sets his stories in very authentic, almost hyper real versions of Tokyo. And you can see the sights as soon as you get off the plane, you can see where Shinkai Makoto's work is set. And that's true of a lot of uh, recent anime hits, international hits. And so that has really driven, I think, the tourism is that people can come and look at the show they love and actually go see the site where a scene takes place. And you couldn't really do that with Ghost in the Shell, you know, you, you, could, you, could, you, could, you couldn't really find uh, Kusanagi's room. Uh, but you can do that with a lot of anime in the 21st century. So I think that's going to continue. Um, Japanese artists seem to be very comfortable now setting works in Japan. Thank you so much. I really appreciated all your comments. I appreciated the very engaged audience uh, tonight. And uh, here's Paul uh, from the Japan America Society. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone. Um, we, we can go on well into the night and well into the morning for those in Japan, uh, just talking about everything related to pop culture. And there's so many ways to look at it as well. So we heard from Nakanishi-san looking at more of a historical perspective. We heard more of the uh, the contemporary or modern take from Roland and, and uh, Nakajima, Nakajima Sensei as well. Um, again, if you do have any questions, I, I've saved all of those so we can, uh, we can share with the speakers. Uh, I cannot guarantee that you will receive a response, but uh, we can try. Um, so again, I, I have recorded those. So again, thank you to our amazing panel of experts and our moderator for helping us better understand pop culture and its importance during COVID-19, which although that it, it began in 2019, we're still experiencing it in 2021. Thank you to our event co-presenter, Japan Society, the promotional partner, Japan America Society of Oregon, and the Japanese government's Walk in the U.S. Talk on Japan program for its support. We would also like to express our gratitude to all of you, the attendees, for your eagerness to explore contemporary Japanese culture. So now we would like to share some upcoming events from the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. And you heard from some events from Japan Society at the beginning of the program. So our next event for Dallas-Fort Worth will be on April 13th or April 14th in Japan with Shinji Koshikawa, who is the author of the bestseller Habits of the Top 5%, Modern Work Style, and 13 other work style innovation books. He will also talk about how we can be more successful and efficient when working from home, which is something that we still are experiencing today. Just two days later, and you should have a slide coming up in a moment, we will have an event on, uh, this will be an event with the OIST Foundation out of Okinawa, and this will focus on the psychological and social impacts of aging in Japan and the US. Lastly, we are also excited to offer Japanese language education. We do have an adult class that is sold out. Um, so we encourage you, we, we, we do have a waiting list for our class. I know Japan Society also has a lot of classes, uh, but for our class with Dallas-Fort Worth, we are sold out for the adult class, but we have openings for our kids class, which is designed for ages nine through 13 and will, will run for eight weeks starting in mid-April. Please visit JAS dfw.org for more information and to register for all these programs. 
We kindly ask that you complete the post-event survey, which will pop up in your browser once the program ends. This concludes our event, and thank you so much for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the evening for our attendees in the U.S. and a wonderful, great, uh, wonderful rest of the day for those in Japan. Thank you so much for, for being with us.